Good morning, and welcome to the National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar series hosted by the Southern IPM Center and sponsored by University of Florida, Texas AgriLife Extension, Auburn University, and University of Georgia's Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Today we are proud to present Lance Osborne from the University of Florida presenting on managing the U.S. invasion of cryptic whitefly species, Q versus B whiteflies. Okay, I appreciate the opportunity to present this. Uh, you'll have to bear with me because this is a little bit old. Uh, we started working on the invasion of the Q biotype back in 2005. I'm going to present some of the work that we did over the, the 2005-2007 and then try to talk a little bit uh, about how it is very relevant and important as we speak because we're starting to see an uptick in the number of detections of Q biotype. And Dr. May detail on that topic in the next webinar. Okay, now it's not... Okay, there we go. We're mainly going to talk about Bemisia. Bemisia has a very large uh, geographical range. It's found on all continents except Antarctica, and it's probably being moved around on ornamental plants. It was first identified on tobacco in Greece, and then subsequent, subsequently found in Florida. The type specimen is from Florida, and it was found on sweet potato, and probably why it's called a sweet potato whitefly. Uh, in Greece, in those areas, it was called a tobacco whitefly. You can see it progresses uh, from 1928 uh, up until 1985 when it was found in uh, Florida. Uh, the Arizona and California uh, detections were probably the A biotype. Uh, this is coincident with me basically moving to Florida, and I was told when I arrived in Florida that I would never work on whiteflies again. Uh, it was my dissertation was on greenhouse whitefly, but a little over four years later, uh, we had major issues in the Apopka area, uh, which turned out to be the B biotype. Whiteflies from the genus Bemisia have caused problems, obviously, uh, for many years. Uh, it started causing major issues in 1925. There is a complex of species and or biotypes that are responsible for these uh, problems. And thus uh, the, the thrust of, of the problems that we dealt with when Q was in, uh, first detected. The issue them being uh, cryptic or uh, biotypes is very difficult to tell them apart. This could be the A biotype, this could be the B biotype, this could be the Q biotype. This makes it very problematic from a regulatory standpoint and trying to de have growers manage them appropriately if they don't know exactly which insects they have. And there is some difference in the biology between the ones we're talking about, when, especially when you talk about pesticide resistance and a little bit of host range and the damage that they cause. The biotype A has been present in the United States for quite a while. Uh, it was the, first, the main one uh, prior to the invasion by the B biotype. As I stated, the B biotype was first found in a popka in a greenhouse on hibiscus, uh, and it's also called the uh, MIM1 or Bamesia argentifolii. And then we have uh, biotype Q, which is also called the MED. Biotype A was basically displaced once biotype B arrived. Uh, the issue, uh, with the exception of probably in Texas, there was a, up, uh, a detection a few years ago in tomato greenhouses where it was spreading virus and caused uh, basically the, the total crop loss in about 40 acres of greenhouse grown tomatoes in Texas. We're mainly going to talk just about the B and Q, however because these are the most problematic species uh, or biotypes that we deal with. Back in 1985, we were working on an IPM program in a commercial greenhouse on hibiscus. We are using biological control to manage the mites, and we were starting to pick up whiteflies. We started to release Incarsia formosa, which should turn the whitefly pupae black, 
Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see the, the, the level of control that we had expected. I did my dissertation on greenhouse whitefly and incarsia, and I was asleep at the wheel. I just assumed that we were dealing with greenhouse whitefly, uh, and we never saw the black pupae and never saw the level of control that we expected. The samples were sent in at that point, and they came back as being Bamesia tabassi. What happened was that in general, it was considered not really a regulatory or a pest because Bemusia had been detected in Florida, obviously, and in other states, and so it was mainly dealt with at a cosmetic level, so plants were able to be shipped with white flies on them. Prior to 1986, the white, main white fly that we dealt with, especially in ornamentals, was a greenhouse white fly. The reason the bee biotype became established and has really uh, become such a problem is one, its reproductive ability, its host range, and its ability to, to uh, develop resistance to pesticides. That same greenhouse where we detected the white fly back in 1985-86, uh, we took samples, Dr. Gary Leiby uh, did bioassays on them, and it was the most susceptible strain ever uh, to uh, pyrethroids. It was extremely uh, sensitive or, or susceptible to being killed by the pyrethroids. Exactly one year later, he collected samples from the same greenhouse, and that population turned out to be the standard for resistance to uh, the pyrethroids. It was the most resistant strain anybody had ever seen in just one year. The implementation of IPM programs that combine new and more targeted Chemistry has allowed for the successful control of bee biotype, especially in the desert southwest on vegetables and cotton. They are mainly using, uh, and this is the mid-90s, they were able to use marathon, distance, and then another uh, insect growth regulator. So they are able to develop an area-wide management program using uh, some selected chemistries, and it was very, very successful. Okay, let's go over the damage. In ornamentals, uh, the major damage uh, is uh, cosmetic. Uh, homeowners and uh, people don't want to see insects on the, their plants, so just the presence of the adult white fly uh, can cause damage. And the level for uh, aesthetic damage was about 5 to 10. If you had that many, uh, they would prevent you from shipping, not for the, because it was a new species or anything like that. It was not a tolerable level from a cosmetic standpoint. Once the population start to get grow, we deal with honeydew, which uh, the result of which is uh, the sooty mold growing on the honeydew, uh, making the plants aesthetically uh, unpleasing and also impacting photosynthesis. Again, another shot of, uh, of a, uh, probably cabbage with sooty mold and adult white flies all over them. We started to pick up some issues with uh, physiological problems. When we visited California and Dr. Greg Nestle's lab, we noticed that their white flies on beans didn't cause any kind of uh, discoloration or any, any other issues other than just uh, the effect of density. Whereas in our trials or chemical trials in Apopka, we could actually pull or determine the the level of control at a distance because what plants that were infested uh, had a yellowing, uh, discoloration, and that sort of thing, which are later called physiological disorders, or you know, they were basically as a result of the immature stages feeding on the plant. As few as three or four immature stages somewhere down the, the, the stem from the leaves that are the new growing tip uh, could result in the, the new leaves turning silver on squash and pumpkins and things like that. Uh, so when you're scouting, you, you look at these leaves that are silvered and you couldn't find the immature white flies, but if you go two or three leaves down, you would find immature white flies. So it didn't take very many immature stages to cause problems. Uh, irregular ripening in tomatoes and silvering in squash, thus the, the common name silver leaf white fly. Uh, this is an ornamental plant, heterohelix or ivy, 
and the leaves down below it were the ones that had the immature stages. There were no adults and no uh, scales on this leaf. Major problem that we deal with uh, worldwide is virus transmission. Initially, we didn't have viruses, but then they started to, to, to pop up on a lot of different crops and causing a significant amount of damage. Uh, the viruses and Bamesia are a limiting factor in the production of food and fiber crops in many parts of the world. People are actually starving in, in certain countries because of the transmission of viruses to uh, cassava. White flies and their viruses uh, are two of the worst crop pests of all times. They're devastating in their effects. Uh, they're particularly uh, devastating to resource poor farmers. Uh, and these are found throughout the tropics and the subtropics. Basically, you know, they, their control presents major challenges, but, and many nations uh, that otherwise never regulated agriculture uh, began to uh, instigate legal measures to try to deal with the issues. That's just a shot of uh, African cassava mosaic virus transmitted by Bamesia. Uh, this a tomato yellow leaf curl virus is a major issue and a limiting factor in the production of tomatoes in many, many places in the world. In the United States, during the period of 1991 to 1992, it was a $200 to $500 million uh, problem. Uh, multiple commodities, lettuce, tomatoes, uh, cotton, uh, just a, a whole array of crops. Imperial Valley from 1991 to 1995 is a hundred million dollars loss annually. Arizona, California, and Texas from 1994 to 98, uh, 153, 154 million dollars. And then there was a publication that for every million dollars of primary loss or crop loss, uh, there was a 1.2 million loss in personal income. Uh, areas that would grow certain crops quit growing them. Uh, this particularly impacted the uh, migrant type worker that would go from one cropping area to the other and many of the crops were were no longer being grown so it disrupted uh, their incomes as well and many jobs were lost. In the ornamental industry uh, initially it became so difficult because of resistance to manage the, this pest uh, you can see what some growers resorted to. This was a vat filled with a cocktail of a couple pesticides and maximum label rates. Uh, these plants were ready for market. They couldn't sell them because of the number of white flies, so the plants were dipped into this vat of pesticide. Particularly disturbing, you can see the, the protective equipment these people were using. This had bifenthrin and acephate in it. They would be dipped, they'd put over here, they'd be Put a, there were ladies standing in the background behind me where I was taking this picture. They were putting plastic uh, covers on them, putting them in boxes, and shipping them. Okay, uh, so we were basically shipping resistant white flies around the world. Then the Q biotype arrived. Okay, this was notorious around the world. Uh, we had heard a lot of stories from. Uh, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, uh, the problems that the Q biotype was causing because of its resistance and tolerance of many pe of the main chemicals that we were using in agriculture and to manage the white fly in the United States. Like I said, it was originally found in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, we feel that it developed its resistance uh, profile basically because it was in uh, closed structures where they were growing, growing tomatoes and other vegetables in Spain and in the Mediterranean and it develops a very uh, significant uh, levels of resistance and it had a potential impact on cotton because of sticky fiber and viruses, specialty crops because of the virus and then ornamentals because of the aesthetic damage and most significantly trade because we're having a lot of people wanting to close down ornamental, uh, movement of ornamentals, uh, not just in the United States, but from, from the United States to other countries. This is an uh, aerial shot of the Iberian Peninsula, 1974, very little production of, of uh, greenhouse vegetables and produce. And this shot over on the right in 2000 was the Iberian Peninsula after they started to expand agriculturally. This is all plastic. And this was uh, quite evident from satellites uh, 
because of the reflection. These are all protected a culture uh, production of crops where the white fly was exposed to any number of pesticides. Okay, the first detection of the Q biotype in the United States came in December 2004. It was found on a poinsettia that was uh, purchased from a retail organic produce market in Arizona uh, by Dr. Tim Dennehy. This was part of the overall whitefly management program in the desert southwest, especially in Arizona. Uh, they would go out and sample any sources of whitefly that they could find. Uh, they would characterize certain populations uh, based on their sensitivity uh, to pesticides, so it would they'd bring them back. They would rear colonies of them so they could get a large enough population to run bioassays. And from what Dr. Dennehy said, his, his uh, staff came to him and wanted to know where in the world he got this particular strain of whitefly because it was totally unique. It was not dying as a result of any of the chemicals that they were uh, uh, testing uh, on it. Uh, and this was something that just went from all the populations that they tested being very susceptible to one that they couldn't kill. And at that point, it was bio. Uh, it was determined genetically to be the Q biotype. This was part of the resistance uh, Arizona resistance monitoring program for both cotton and vegetables. Like I said, the point set of strain O4 strain showed significant risk resistance to the two major classes of pesticide used in cotton. So it stood out from all other white fly samples. And the importance of this is that the two major classes were the uh, neonix, uh, imidacloprid, and distance, uh, which was the idea, which was a cornerstone and the foundation for their management program uh, since the invasion of the bee biotype. So their program really depend on uh, the white flies being susceptible to those two compounds. So essentially you can understand uh, when they went from a $500 million loss in a year to uh, uh, to very minimal, well not minimal, but uh, cer certainly uh, losses that they could tolerate and then all of a sudden here's something that might threaten uh, their, their overall programs. And so needless to say they panicked and they were very uh, concerned about this. The initial response by regulators was to quarantine nurseries in California after uh, the APHIS and the state regulatory uh, officials did tracebacks and found that the, the plants probably came from a nursery in California and so they started to, they wanted to, they basically quarantined those. Industries be, were at odds at this point about what the appropriate response should be. Some commodity groups wanted much stricter regulations placed on the movement of ornamental plants, would, would shut down especially uh, the shipment of poinsettias. The problem with this is that growers can't tell the difference between the Q biotype and the B biotype. So their management programs using biological control uh, and were basically totally dis would be totally disrupted if they had to deal with a zero tolerance. That means they'd have to spray anytime they'd find a white fly because of threat of being quarantined, they'd They'd spray uh, basically as a preventative, uh, and as any of you have dealt with white flies, it's almost er impossible to eradicate white flies, even with good pesticides. So it, it put them in a in a real uh, bad position because they would have to ramp up the amount of chemicals used. It would be very expensive, and when you have zero tolerance, uh, that basically uh, results in resistance development. So not only would we have a resistant B biotype, our Q biotype, we'd start to develop and force uh, resistance development in the B biotype as well. And because of this, uh, there was a lot of concern. This also was an issue of regulate this uh, a new trend because as regulating pests that were already widely distributed, because it was identified as the same species as the bee biotype. Both were being called Bamesia tabassi. 
and we now we're starting to regulate pests at the subspecies level at the biotype or strain level and this was fairly unique and it causes some problems when people that are trying to manage these pests can't tell the difference between one strain and one biotype uh, from the other in the in the field excuse me movement on plant, uh, pests on plant material uh, and the reaction of other co commodities, uh, the initial response was to stop all shipment. I mean, that uh, poinsettia, that was the initial response. And this caused uh, uh, the commodity groups to start to put pressure on APHIS. And APHIS, with uh, a very uh, good uh, administrator, uh, Dr. Osama Elissi, uh, he came up with the strategy uh, working with uh, one of the, the the people from SAF, uh, Lynn Schmally, they decided to develop a three-pronged task force. And this was fairly unique. This hadn't been done, as far as I know, with any other uh, major pest at that point in time. So we had representatives from industry in this task force. We had representatives from various, various state and federal uh, organizations, uh, APHIS and the, uh, people from uh, plant the state plant boards uh, and you know we had people from Florida Texas and that sort of thing and then they developed a technical advisory committee which they had uh, scientists from all over the country in various commodities uh, represented the idea initially was just to facilitate a discussion about the Q biotype uh, to try to prevent or minimize the pest potential impacts on the various industries within American agriculture mainly uh, worried about the impact on vegetables, ornamentals, and cotton. Again, the leadership was really uh, Osama Elissi and Lynn Schmally. Unbelievable job that they did. It became initially a more about managing people than about managing invasive species. Okay, and this, this is what we found from every one of the invasive species that I've dealt with in the last 20 years. It's more about managing people and how people respond to the invasive species than actually res responding to the pest. So we had industry leaders that uh, from cotton, we had uh, SAF for the four oil culture, we had what was then ANLA and now American Hort uh, representing nursery, uh, and then we had uh, various representatives from around the country that represented the vegetables. Tried to identify the major overall goals and objectives that this task force needed to tackle, both short and long-term practical solutions that could help the affected industry as a whole in combating, combating the pest in the most effective and efficient manner. So we tried to pull everybody together to try to develop a management program and a response that would be satisfactory to all the commodities and still try to manage this particular threat. Twenty some odd technical experts uh, including chemical companies uh, uh, and university, ARS, APHIS all came together to try to uh, to establish the goals and objectives of the task force. You can see this is a sampling of some of the people that were involved. Uh, Tim Dennehy and I were co-chairs. Uh, Tim worked in Arizona on cotton, was the first person to find, uh, again, his lab found the, the B, I mean the Q biotype. Uh, Dr. Cindy McKenzie, uh, Frank Byrne, and uh, let's see, uh, Judy Brown were responsible for de developing techniques to identify and, and determine the difference or separate one white fly population from another based on uh, molecular techniques. The major tasks were developed and each one of these five uh, uh, areas had a co-chair uh, and a number of people in each area working on uh, trying to develop uh, management programs, uh, techniques to, to diagnose uh, or detect the differences, developing surveys, putting together best management programs, outreach, trying to make sure that we could get what we found out to the people that actually needed it, and then some basic biology, practical biology and ecology. 
Federal and state regulatory officials from many of the impacted states were working together under the leadership of Osama Lissi and trying to make a system work that was using operational plans to prevent or minimize the pest impact and spread. Uh, so we had representatives from Tennessee and New York, Florida, California, Arizona, Texas, anybody that wanted to be involved was welcome at the table. Again, the major tasks that we dealt with for a couple of years were the detection and survey, which was absolutely critical. Okay, we needed to know where these uh, Q individuals were and populations. Uh, we had to have survey techniques that would allow us to detect them and separate uh, whitefly samples into B and Q, and so we could track the spread of these whiteflies across the country. And Dr. McKenzie will talk about that in the next women webinar. We needed to develop uh, pest management programs with the idea of trying to prevent uh, increase in resistance in either uh, biotype. Uh, in many cases, the resistant B may even be worse than a resistant Q because of their fecundity and host range and that sort of thing. We needed to find out where these things were coming from from offshore on ornamental plants. And then again, outreach. So a little bit about the survey. The foundation for all of this was that APHIS agreed not to regulate, that this was not going to be a regulated pest. Now that doesn't mean that the states couldn't regulate it. So Osama met with the, uh, the National Plant Board and the representatives there to try to get a consensus to make sure that if we detected Q in a particular state, greenhouse, whatever, that they wouldn't impose quarantines. Okay, what this allowed was that we could start to collect samples from all over the country and uh, we only, re because they would allow us to, to accept anonymous and report uh, to people or to the regulators anonymously where we found these things. We only had to report the state that the queue was found in and the crop that it was found on. So we didn't say it was found at a particular nursery. We just had to say that it was found in Florida, for example. So we, the idea was to have four different area places where we could get these samples sent for processing and using uh, one technique for that everybody agreed on for uh, determining whether it was the B or the Q. This could take a few days, so it was a little bit time consuming and there was a lag involved. And again, Dr. Uh, McKenzie will talk about newer techniques that allowed, uh, in which we can get almost real-time uh, information. The idea was to sample the, the more southern tier of states to see, uh, you know, where the where the white fly was. And if we agreed to do 30 sites per state, the greenhouse would uh, entail 60 to 80 percent of the samples, and the open environment outdoors would be 20 to 40. We were going to enlist uh, the regulatory officials in each state to do this, but we found out very quickly that that was not going to work. Okay, We also added additional states because we started to have reports of uh, problems in other states, and so we had uh, uh, wherever somebody was at risk, and especially growing poinsettias, we were able to add uh, places. Uh, infrastructure and the capability for handling samples. We are seeing response, especially as a result of some of our outreach and sending out 10,000 uh, notices to growers all over the country. We didn't get very many uh, samples from the various state uh, or regulatory agency, but we got an amazing number of samples from growers all over the country. They stepped up because they could do it anonymously, they would send in white flies to Dr. McKenzie, Frank Byrne, Judy Brown, and we were able to map the spread and the distribution of the Q white fly within the United States. And it all has to do with the response and growers in the ornamental industry doing the right thing. They wanted to know what they had so they could better tailor their pest management programs to deal with it appropriately. So the solutions to the problem were communication at all levels between commodities. You know, there's a lot of suspicion between the cotton and ornamentals. 
Okay, Cotton felt that we were probably doing the wrong thing. We probably weren't capable of managing resistance, but once we started showing them our resistance management plans, the tools that we could use to manage the, the problem in greenhouses, I think they became very comfortable with our ability to at least manage the problem. We had a lot more going than they had actually given us credit for. We did a lot of education and outreach. Uh, any trade magazine that we could find, any any pub, uh, public meeting, we had somebody there uh, educating growers and the general public. We found that once we removed some of the communication issues, uh, the cooperation was amazing. Okay, we we worked very well with the people both in vegetables and in cotton. A lot of applied research, just screening and efficacy trials. And then a systems approach of looking at and you know, how we manage the overall system. So how do we respond? Efficacy trials in let's see what time do I have? Okay, efficacy trials on greenhouse ornamentals in California, Georgia, Florida, New York. In California, we had uh, Jim Bethke, uh, Ron Otting in Georgia, uh, Gary Leiby in Florida, and Dan Gilrain in New York. Really, the only colonies of the Q biotype were in these labs, and so we had the ability to uh, evaluate chemicals on them. Uh, Doctor, I think Denny had some, and Frank Byrne. Okay, so we in this slide you can see a number of active ingredients. I think we actually screened some 42 different active ingredients on the Q biotype and B biotype. You can see the number of experiments. Uh, and then a kind of an average of the levels of control with each of the compounds that we, we obtain, okay, using either a foliar or a drench spray, a drench uh, uh, treatment, uh, and you can see the level of controls. We ranged anywhere from 91 or better uh, down to uh, some that were in the 20% or less, okay. So there were some major, and this is imidacloprid, the standard, 20% control to or 50%. Here's one, another neonic, only 8% control. So you can see we had a problem. We develop a set of guidelines, uh, we call it the Management Program for White Flies on Propagated Ornamentals with a major emphasis on Q. But we wanted to make sure that the growers that had B had something and could understand how to put a program together to manage the B as well. And this was uh, funded by IR4, USDA Floral Initiative, uh, CSREES -S back then, uh, NIFA now. And so we developed a, a, a systems approach and a, a, a dichotomous type key based on what stage of the plant you're growing, uh, mainly looking at poinsettia at that point. And so we had uh, different areas that you go to. If you had mist on and they're, they're rooted cuttings, there were certain compounds and certain things you could do. Uh, if they didn't have a root system, the neonics are probably not going to be taken up as a drench. And so we had some other things that we'd work on. But the bottom line is we had the tools and we had a program that growers could at least have a best uh, best guess attempt at managing these. And we had whether we had data to back this up. So certain compounds we didn't have data. The white fly may, uh, program was again presented at major industry meetings, published in many trade journals. Uh, SAF and the trade organizations sent it out to all of their uh, clientele. Uh, many of the magazines did as well. So within a couple months, basically they were delivered to over 10,000 growers nationwide. We developed web websites as a means of quashing rumors because that was one of the major issues we were dealing with and disseminating the information as quickly as possible. Collectively, and this is, these are old data, okay, collectively over the that like three year period we had published six referee journal articles, 40 popular press articles, 80 presentations on Bimesia biotypes, uh, we had two whitefly websites were developed and maintained for disseminating whitefly information. The websites were particularly important and we find that for every invasive species we've had that developing a website is critical. It enables us to information to exchange information, it helps with the educational process, it helped us remove misunderstandings because it was we could re refer to the same uh, spot with as up-to-data information as we have. We could vet it through the whole committee so everybody agreed. 
Uh, it helped organize the process and the business of the task force. Again, it helped to reduce the nature and severity of rumors. It was some, somewhat time-consuming and difficult to make everyone in the committee feel that, uh, that they had, their input was valid, that there was no ownership of anything that went on it, that they could put something on that as long as it, was, uh, it wasn't throwing one industry under the bus and trying to make sure that it was valid uh, and, and up-to-date information. Initially, two one for the U.S., and we had problems shipping uh, ornamentals to the uh, EU as well, so we had two management programs, one for import and one for export, and for moving plants around the country. And again, it was over uh, 10,000 ornamental growers and propagators. Management of the program is, has been used to manage three new invasive white flies in Florida. So it continues to pay, play dividends. We have major issues with three new invasive species here in Florida, and we've used the, the management program that enabled us to develop an IPM program for the Rugo spiraling whitefly, and it's worked so well that we have not, we're having problems even finding uh, the whitefly. The bottom line, the Q has never been detected in the field which was one of our major goals. We didn't want it getting out from ornamental greenhouses. We didn't want it being spread to the cotton or vegetable growing regions in the desert southwest. Uh, we have sampled, and Dr. McKenzie will talk about it in her talk, uh, vegetables and ornamentals around the country. It has only been detected on one submission from a tomato plant, but that was grown in a greenhouse where it was commingled with ornamentals that also had the cue. We have found it on herbs. We found it on peppermint. And it's moved between uh, a couple places in Florida. But again, these were all greenhouse grown and never occurred outdoors. Now, we're not out of the woods yet. The detections continue. We've had an uptick, uptick in the number of detections of the queue this last year, whether that's a result in people not using the most important management tool we have is in the index. Because of the bee issue, nobody knows, but again, uh, Dr. McKenzie will go in greater detail on that in a few minutes. The, there were some, and when I talk about managing people, again, it was absolutely critical to have two people uh, running this uh, and, and trying to work between the various industries and work between the various uh, uh, state regulatory officials and the two people that uh, basically did this, and without them the project or the program would never have worked, and that's Dr. Osama Alissi, who's now the Deputy Administrator for APHIS BPQ, and Lynn Schmalley, who's the Senior Director of the Government Relations of Society of American Florists. This is just a snapshot of the people that uh, worked on this project, uh, from growers and scouts, to chemical company uh, representatives, to retired uh, professors, and again, uh, Dr. McKenzie and the people at APHIS and, and over here is Lynn Schmalley. IR4 was also critical because they had helped collect the chemical uh, data <clears throat> and efficacy trials and collated them into the, the programs <clears throat> and the data that, excuse me, <clears throat> so the data could be disseminated in a timely fashion. Uh, Southern Plant Diagnostic Networks was involved, IPM, uh, Florida, USDA, uh, APHIS, University of Florida, and in Florida, the Division of Plant Industry. I'd like to thank Lance Osborne for his presentation and thank all of you for attending the webinar as part of the National Invasive Species Awareness Week. This recording and the recordings of the other webinars will be made available at youtube.com slash southern IPM center.